And Braco 14's here. Let's do a review. Now, on Braco 14 is a pretty sneaky release. And I say that because if you know nothing about it and you installed it, you're probably not going to notice anything fundamentally different. However, under the hood, this is probably one of the biggest changes to Umbraco for several years. So I'm going to start off this video quickly showing you how to install a empty Umbraco V14 site. And if I'm honest, if you're an Umbraco Pro, nothing's really changed here. So you can skip to five minutes of the future because that's where we get into the good stuff. So in the second part, I'm going to go into why this is such a monumental change. The three things that you really need to understand because this will impact how you build sites in Umbraco. Now, as always, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe if you want to support this channel. There's going to be a mini series on Umbraco 14 coming up. And don't forget, I have written a book. Link here, click on that, support this channel, support your boy. So, with that said, let's get into this installation gap. So the first thing we need to do is install the installation template and in .NET we do that via the CLI and we do a .NET space new space install space Umbraco with a capital U with a dot and then templates with a capital T. So umbraco.template with an S at the end. Now once I do that you should see that version 14.00 gets installed. Now after we do that we need to create a website. And we do that with .NET again, we do new, we do Umbraco, and then we can do a dash N, and then we give our project a name. So I'm going to call my project Umbraco 14. Now, after you run that command, what will happen is in the background, the installation wizard is going to generate all the files required to run your blank website. It's also going to create this empty CS proj file that we can then load within Visual Studio. So if I look within my file system, you can see we've got this Umbraco 14 project folder that's been created. In here, I just need to load that one. Now, after I do that, if I look within Solution Explorer, you can see we've got all my website files. We've got a view, we've got a www root, as well as the program.cs and app settings.json. Now, if I just launch this site within the local debugger, what should happen is the Umbraco installation wizard should load. So the focus of this installer is to create all the database configuration for you. And the first thing we need to provide is the user that you want to use to log into the CMS. So in this example, I'm going to call my user admin. I'm going to call it admin at admin.com. And I'm going to put a password of P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D-1. So I'll quickly show you that in case you want to copy this repo from my GitHub, which is linked to in the link below. Now, after you click next, you get to the consent for telemetry opt-in screen, and you can change this by this little slider. Let's set this to minimal. Now, clicking on next, you need to do your database configuration. So where should the installer install the database? Now, my general rule of thumb here is that if you're just creating a quick and dirty sample site, something to throw away, SQLite is fine. However, if you're planning on creating an actual website, you will want to install your database into SQL itself. Now, the reason for this is that it's going to be much easier to back up your site, transfer it onto different servers, and even run SQL queries against the database itself. So going back to this database configuration screen, for this demo site, I'm going to use SQLite. However, for production, use this option. If you didn't know how to install a database using SQL Server and setting it up, then look in the related description below. Now, after we do this, if I click install, what should happen is the installer is going to fail. Now, the reason why isn't an unknown error is because my password wasn't long enough. So if I go back to this original page where we've got password one, let's just say password again. If I click next, do all the same steps, you'll see that this time that the installer works takes about two seconds, which is lightning fast. And if I log in, clicking on login is going to take us to the CMS where we're now ready to do our new feature call. The coolest new feature in Umbraco V14, in my opinion, is a brand new backend UI. Now, if you've used Umbraco before, 
it might not be immediately obvious why this is such a game changing feature. And let me quickly prove this to you. So on the screen, I've logged into my website, which I've yet to upgrade to v14. See next week's video. And this is using a Braco v13. So at the top here, we've got this little palette, whatever you call it. It's dark blue. We've got some options here. We've got our content screen. We've got a media picker. We've got some settings here. We've got some packages. Now, if I swap over to our brand new V14 site, the home page looks a little bit different, but you know, the content pane here looks similar. We've got a media tab, which looks again, pretty similar. We've got settings. Settings, there's some subtle differences here. We've got a few different options when we expand things. We've also got a slightly different UI, but again, it kind of feels the same. Now, because the two backends look pretty similar, you might be misled into thinking that there's been a few CSS tweaks and nothing else. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So within V14, the backend has been completely recreated. So it's not just some CSS tweaks. There's three important things that you need to understand. So in order for you to understand the magnitude of these changes, we can head over to uui.umbraco.com. And from here, you're going to see a complete online example of all the latest UI components which are now being used in the backend. So quickly scanning this list, you can see we've got buttons, displays, input, layouts, symbols, design, loaders. And if I expand this, you can see we've got action bars, breadcrumbs, and clicking on each one of these components is going to give you an example of how it will appear, as well as a bunch of example code as well as documentation about how you can implement this component in the back end yourself. Now, I definitely don't have time in this video to go through every single one of these components in minute detail, but let's quickly see some of the things we can get. So we've got buttons, menu items, pagination tabs. We've got components around displays. So we've got cards, popovers, progress bars. We've got scroll containers. We've got posts. We've got a bunch of form related stuff. So how to style a form, checkboxes, inputs, radios, text areas, toggles. We've got a bunch of stuff around layouts, which are mainly modals, boxes, and tables. We've got some symbol related stuff, so carrots, icons, file and folder displays. We've got some design related information, so how the CSS works, the style guideline. We've got some loaders, so a loading bar, a loading circle. And then at the bottom, We've actually got some handy examples of how you can add multiple components together. So we've got a login example here and underneath here, we've also got an app header example. So you can see how the actual menu in the back end was built. So based on this new information, you can now hopefully appreciate how much effort is taking the team to actually make these changes. Because note, it's not just a slight CSS tweak here. Instead, the whole top ribbon, it's been recreated. Everything within this sidebar has been recreated. Everything within this panel here has been recreated, all to use these brand new components. Cool. So obviously having a UI library is a nice step forward. However, there's still a really important aspect about this backend update that we haven't thought about. How do these components actually get powered? How does Abraco get the data from the database and then render it in the CMS? And this is where the management API comes into play, because as well as just doing this UI update, there's also been a big fundamental change on how we access data in the backend as well. Now, because we're all developers, the easiest way to talk about architecture changes is to have a diagram. And lucky for us, if you go to the Embraco 14 release notes over at the blog, we've got one of those. So the big change in Umbraco v14 is this management API. And we can see here that we've got our back office named Bellissima, and we've got an extension API and a context API. But the really important thing to note here is that any request, anything to access the back office goes through this management API first. Now, obviously in terms of CMS and website creation, headless websites, headless APIs are the talk of the town. And this is how a majority of companies are now building their websites. So in the last few versions of Umbraco, we had the content delivery API to get content. We've got the media API in order to access media. Now we've got the management API to do CMS related stuff remotely. 
So obviously CMS related stuff sounds intriguing and in order to figure out exactly what we can do, let's head over to the documentation. Now, just in case you weren't aware, from Umbraco 12 and the headless API first got delivered, Umbraco ships with Swagger and Swagger will allow you to see exactly what the endpoints do. So in order to access Swagger, do slash Umbraco slash Swagger slash index.html. You should access this portal and then within this drop down, you can look at the Umbraco delivery API. But the one we're interested in here is the management API. Now, in terms of what you can do with this management API, it's impressive. But if I just scroll down, take a look at the sheer number of things that you can do. And it's going to take me a good 20 to 30 seconds to get to the bottom of the list. So basically, in essence, anything that you can do within the Embraco backend, you can now access via REST API. And this is an impressive amount of new APIs to add into a single release. So if I go to the top, let's quickly scroll and have a look at the types of activities you can do. So we can get all the cultures in the CMS. We can read, edit and delete different data types. We can read, edit and delete different dictionary items. We can look and create and edit document blueprints. We can create blah, 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 do all the rest API stuff on document types. We've got the ability to look at different document versions and update things. We can access documents. We then got the ability to do dynamic routing. We can access the health checker. We can access the help. We can do imaging. We can import stuff. We can access the search indexer. We can even install Umbraco. We've got language related tasks. We've got the log viewer. We've got manifest. We've got the ability to create different media types. We've also got the ability to upload and access media itself. We've got the ability to add member groups, member types, members. We can do model builder related stuff. So we can do content modeling. We've got object types, O embed. We've got packages, partial views, previews, profiling, property types, cache stuff, redirect stuff, relationship type, relations, scripts, searches, security segments, server, static files, style sheets, tags, telemetry, templates, temporary files, that upgrades, user data, user groups, as well as users. So this management API, in my opinion, is amazing. As we've seen, it pretty much 10x is the amount of things that you can do to Umbraco via a REST API. So if you're planning on building a headless website with Umbraco, this is going to be super handy. Now, the final part of the conversation here is around how to customize the backend UI yourself. Now, the best place for me to start explaining how we can build a custom UI is our classic architecture diagram again. So we love a good architecture diagram. Now, in order to extend the back office, if we look in this quadrant, we can see that we have these two different APIs. So extension API and context API. And note that basically anything which goes into the back office has to go via these two things. Now also note that the extension API and the context API, these are not REST APIs. And if we look again in the architecture diagram, this thing here, we can see that all our REST APIs, the management, the content delivery, the media stuff, this is living in a different area in the architecture. So what exactly are these extension API and context API? Well, if we jump over to our good friend NPM, you should be able to find this new package called at cms slash back office. So we can see that it's still in beta. It was released very recently, basically in term with the 14 release. And in here, we've got a bunch of different things which will allow you to create custom extensions in Umbraco. Now, if we go to the latest 14 documentation, you can see we've now got this context API documentation. And from here, you know, it is a work in progress, but it's going to explain how this context API works. But basically, if you need to grab the Umbraco context, just like you did in previous versions, then we've got this API to help you get a context token, which can be used for consumption and all that kind of jazz. Now, if you do a search for the extension API, you're not going to see anything here at the moment. So I'm guessing this will be updated in the future. However, if we say jump to this GitHub documentation from the Umbraco docs, you can see that when we create a custom dashboard, 
in order to start accessing and overriding different things, we can use that Umbraco CMS back office thing. We can access APIs, SDKs, utils, whatever you want to call it from this library. So here we've got this umb element mixin. You can see now that we can now extend the element mixin and then we can come in with our own custom HTML and create our own custom dashboards. Now, if we look at the creating a property editor example, again, you can see that we're going to be creating some sort of JavaScript. We're going to be using and referencing our Umbraco back office package. This time it's using the extension dash registry. This is then going to give us this editor UI element, which we can then extend using list and all this kind of good stuff, then create our own property editor. Now, when you combine the new UI library, the management API, the brand new NPM package, as well as all the work required to make the back end work, unsurprisingly, there's not really much else to talk about in this V14 release because that in itself is a monumental amount of work. Now, it is probably just worth mentioning that they are V14 updates for forms, deploy, commerce, and workflow. I'm not going to go through that here. But aside from that, that's everything that you need to be aware of, of what's happened in V14. And I think this brings us to a nice place to finish this video. Now, obviously, this isn't everything that we can cover in terms of a Braco V14. So in the upcoming weeks, expect to see an upgrade video to see how painful it is to upgrade custom backend extensions. There's also going to be a management API deep dive video and potentially a deep dive into the component library. And finally, a lot of people have been asking for a Blazor and headless website integration with Umbraco. So I'll probably do one of those as well. However, if there is a topic you want me to cover, let me know in the comments below. I'm always happy to delve into the Umbraco goodness. Now, aside from that, if you do like these videos, please comment, like, and subscribe. And close where I might actually finish doing these videos sooner rather than later after this series is finished. So leave some comments, otherwise I might stop doing them. Aside from that, on the screen, if that video has been created, you should see a link to this upgrade video for V14. Aside from that, till next time, happy coding.